My name is Josh. I get the privilege of being the, the lead servant here at Real Life on the Palouse, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today, especially today. Because a year ago today, I woke up in a cardiac ICU room. Can you believe? It's been a year that the Lord's given me an extra year here. Uh, and so, yeah, I had, a, I had a rough go a year ago today. My wife and I were kind of reliving some of our past uh, trauma slash experiences uh, in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, but we suffered through it on the boat yesterday, so we made it. We made it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I'm excited to be here with you guys. I'm excited to uh, share what God has for us today on uh, Do Not Worry. This is, when I was an early Christian, this was a go-to for me. It's still a go-to for me today. This is one of my most leaned-upon passages in my life. Um, when I'm obeying this well, my perspective on God's kingdom seems to be the most accurate. And when I'm not, I am what you might want to call a mess. Uh, a mess for the kingdom. Uh, and I, I guess as I think about this idea of, of do not worry, it's pretty simple to say, and I'm going to give you statistics and all these things, and then you're going to leave here and not worry anymore. Now, we're going to hopefully have a couple of tools where you can start reprogramming things that you worry about. And hopefully we can give you those because Jesus is concerned about us and our worry. Remember who this is to. This is, we're in the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew uh, is the tax collector, and this is a gospel for his uh, Jewish audience, and we get the privilege of having it today. Uh, these Jews have a lot to worry about. When you think about it, uh, these Jews are being uh, run over externally by the Romans. Even as he's writing, uh, even when you think about these, these letters and these things, like the, the temple was destroyed again because they revolted. If we think about that around 63, 66 A AD. So they have a lot to worry about. Like, you know, if we're like, hey, a couple of years back, our, our White House got ran over and it's gone. We would have lots to worry about. They have uh, uh, so external things to worry about and wars and rulers and people that they don't want in power and all these things. And then they have internal things that they're worrying about. They're fighting the corrupt priesthood. And then they just have basic things to worry about, which we heard last week when we talk about like treasures in heaven and what people are storing up and what they're trying to do and what do these treasures look like and what are we supposed to be taking to heaven and, and I got to get me and mine and all those things and some of the same things that, that we might be thinking about today. But they have food insecurities. They have a lot to worry about. As I was preparing for this uh, message, I ran across one of Greg Groeschel's sermons and it's in our study notes. I went and looked at those today, and I don't know if you guys know this, but in your bulletins, there's a QR code, and you can take a picture instead of having to type any website, and you can press a button, and it takes you to the length of all of our additional resources. And I was scrolling through these additional resources, and I was like, man, we have a lot of additional resources. Then I remembered we're in week like 20-something of this sermon series. But like, if you really wanted to become as much of an expert as you possibly could, all of that is right there for you to go do that. So there's another link to this uh, additional resource, and it was one of uh, Greg Groeschel's sermons. And uh, he said some things in there that really kind of uh, moved me. And I just wanted to be like, yeah, I want to say that, but I'm Josh, I'm not him. But one of his quotes uh, that I've been thinking about is this quote. And it says, what you worry about the most might reveal where you trust God the least. What you worry about the most might reveal where you trust God the least. And I started thinking about that. And I started thinking about the things that I worry about. And I started to try and keep these in mind and have kind of a like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scribble down some things that I'm worried about and, and see what these things are and see why do they come. And, and think about this too, that worry starts in the mind. It's almost like grooves and a record player. How many people remember records? They had records, these things called records. They were vinyl. And the way that those things work, as I understand it, is there was grooves in these record players. And you can move the needle and play a different, different song on those things. But think about worry in your life as grooves in a record player. And some of us have some pretty neat grooves in our record player. And I caught myself this week diving into some of these grooves again. 
and I was trying to think of these patterns. What are the patterns of things that I'm worrying about, and why do I go back to them? And so this week, I have a couple relational hurts. Well, I have more than a couple. These are just ones I was thinking about. Uh, I have a couple relational hurts that I keep going back to, and it's like I'm letting these, space, these things, and it's not their fault. I, I believe everybody's tried to do what they can do to repair those relationships, but I kind of groove back into that hurt again and start thinking about that hurt again and sit in that hurt, and I'm like, how come I keep doing this? Why am I still unsettled here? And I'll go to this other groove, and I kind of jump grooves to different songs, but they're songs that aren't life-giving. They're songs of worry that I need to have better on-ramps on, and I need to reprogram the record in a sense. So 90% of our thoughts are just repetitive. And think about this. What's the difference between a grave and a rut? Anybody know the answer? The answer is a good one. The difference between a grave and a rut is how long you've been digging. And some of you have been digging a long time. And that rut seems pretty deep. That groove in that record is well-worn. And I wonder how that's serving you when you think about the idea of worry. One of the biggest moments that I had about worry in my life uh, recently, well, I wouldn't say recently, I guess recently is 2016 or 17. I was thinking about this. Um, in 2016 or 17, I was the overseer of our finances of our church. Uh, I was uh, in our staffing. And uh, we were struggling as a church financially. And I worried a lot. I remembered looking at our staff at that time and wondering who I was going to have to let go. I remember my whiteboard has all of these like ideas and plans of like, okay, what if everybody took a 20% pay cut? We could keep everybody here. We can continue on. And I had all of these things and I would stay up at night worrying about the finances of the church. I worried so much that all of a sudden I started to have these splotches on my left uh, side over here and I went to the doctor and uh, I went in there and I'm like, I don't know what these are, but they're itchy and they're weird right here. And he's like, those are shingles. And he's like, you're 42, Josh. Why do you have shingles? Are you in a high stress situation? Is there something you're really concerned about? I was like, well, as a matter of fact, there is. And so I remember thinking about all of these things that were going to go on and the things I was going to have to shift and move and how is it going to appear to the church. And you guys want to know what happened? God took care of it. Not as fast as I would have liked him to, not the way I would have liked to have it done, but it was almost like it was his will that was to be done, not my will to be done. And so I think about all those things that I worked up and all those things that I was going through and all those things I was thinking, and I was in worry. I worried, worried, worried. So some things happen to you when you worry. I worry sometimes about my health. I worry about my parents as they're aging and, and needing, needing to help them. I worry about my adult children. I worry about my country. I worry about the resources of the church. Uh, I worry about the, the church mall alone. There's all kinds of things that I worry about, but what do I do with that worry? Where does it cross the line from where it be it's concerned and something that you needs to be addressed and concerned and then it becomes worry is when it starts dominating your mind and creating those grooves in that record. You know, when you are consistently worry about something, the muscles in your shoulders and your neck can tense up. What? Who would have thought about that, huh? It can lead to headaches and migraines. Every adult in here is like, do you notice the older you get, the more you understand the things you could worry about? You're like, man, when you was little, I was like, yeah, I'm just going to go off the stage. Just, just fall. Bam. Okay, I got up. Didn't care. Didn't matter. But we start to kind of pile on these burdens. Do you know that uh, if you worry a ton, it can make you more likely to have high blood pressure or a heart attack? Or a stroke? I laugh because I are one. And what happens with worry when you keep playing that long enough in your brain, you let it, and it can manifest into anxiety and be part of your body and can start affecting you. So Jesus has good cause to tell us, do not worry. So let's read the text today, one of my favorite texts of all time, Matthew 6, 25 through 34. And here's what it says. 
Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. So again, pause. Anytime you see a therefore, you have to say, what's it there for? Look at you guys. So what did he just there for previous to this? Treasures in heaven. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You cannot serve both God and money. And you can't, don't worry about where you're storing up your, your treasures. If you try and store them up on earth, they'll be destroyed and all those things are going to be, you know, it's going to go away. You need to store up your treasures in heaven. And because of that, since you need to store up your treasures in heaven, maybe you shouldn't worry about your stuff on earth. And so here's what he says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry even about your life or what you will eat or drink or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than, than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. And if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow they're thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. There's some pretty interesting pieces within that text that uh, would jump out from you, jump out at you, especially if you look at it from a Jewish standpoint. So, or as a Christian standpoint, as we look at it, when you think about worry, who worries? Who worries in this text? Who does Jesus say are the type of people that worry? The pagans. The pagans. What's a pagan? A non-God, a non-Christ believer. Maybe they have lots of gods that they believe in. But they, they're worrying about all of these things. They're actually not even worrying about it. They're running after all of these things. And guess what we're supposed to look like? We're supposed to be different than the pagans. The Jews are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be different. We're not supposed to be the, uh, concerned and worried uh, like everybody else, all the people that don't follow God. We're supposed to walk with maybe a little different of a piece. That doesn't mean that we're not concerned. But when you have a concern and you address that concern or you give that concern over to God, you can step back from that and be like, he already knew about it. I just realized it because he already knew about your concern and I just realized it. And so now I'm going to acknowledge that I just realized that God, God, there's a pretty big problem here. Uh, I know you already knew about this, but now I know about it and I would like you to take care of it. Because uh, I don't want to worry. So you think about worrying as this habit that is learned and taught. And again, the statistics, 90% of the things you worry about are never going to happen. And the other 10% you can't do anything about. But that quote still has not stopped me from worrying. So as worry starts in your mind, and in our video... <laughs> Has anybody ever run off like that where you just start just like just keep going? Future tripping, there you go. You start future tripping. Start diving into all these things. There's a lot of things that could happen, right? Like God could turn off the gravity for 10 seconds. That would really not be great for us. Have you thought about that? Just switch off 10 seconds. Just whoop. Okay, I'll turn it back on. Like, man. There's all of these things. And is our culture not designing you and desiring for you to move towards worry? How many of the advertisements that you see are trying to instill fear? They're trying to instill insecurity and in all of these things. And you are not enough. You will not have enough. And we're just like, Rawr. 
just eating it up. We should be eating up God's word, right? So as things change from being something in your head to actually affecting your body, some of us become addicted and programmed to worry. It's almost like it's unnatural to not worry. Like worry is the normal. I got to be worrying about something. What can I worry about? One of our younger guys in our sermon club, sorry, mother-in-law for saying this in advance. One of our younger guys in our sermon club is like, I don't know. I don't really like, I don't get it. Like, I don't, I don't see it. I'm like, oh, you're not married. You don't have a mother-in-law. You don't know about worry. Or father-in-law. Let's beat up those guys too. But like as this worry moves and grows in your life, some of you laughed. Okay, you're like looking at your spouse. It's like, that was you. Some of us, again, were programmed to worry. So who worries according to Jesus? The pagans do, for they run after these things. Which force is that? Which force in this world wants you to worry? And which force does not want you to worry? Did God really say you couldn't eat from the trees in the garden? No, he said I couldn't eat from the one in the middle. See, the deceiver is trying to design you to worry. And what's the opposite of worry? What's the opposite of worry? Could it be peace? Could it be trust? Will you worry if you trust that God's going to take care of it? If you really believe that God's going to take care of it, are you going to worry about it? And think about this. Do you remember what God has already taken care of? Do you have a list of things in your mind where you're like, oh, yeah, remember when that was really, really tough and God took care of it? Do you remind yourself over and over how God has showed up? And maybe you don't have a lot of those stories, and maybe you need to be in community where those stories are going to be told. And maybe in our communities, we're talking about how God has showed up. I was thinking about this uh, when we were celebrating Monday, the first Monday of every month, uh, except for this one because it was July 4th. So this, uh, uh, No, that was right. The first Monday of every month, we celebrate at our, at our staff meeting. The whole, the whole meeting is designed for celebrations. And so we'll sit there, and there's some offenders who celebrate quite a bit. Sherry Hall. <laughs> Annie. No, uh, we have some folks that celebrate quite a bit. And you know what they're celebrating? You guys. Hey, this really cool thing, you know, this gal did this thing, and this person, this, and they we're celebrating, and we're, rem- we're remembering all of the cool things that God is doing within our midst. Because there is a problem or two in our church. Number one, because I'm here. That's the first problem. But people are here. And so we have problems. We step on each other's toes and there's things that we do. But there's so many cool things that God is doing. And so here's uh, what I would say is a, 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 a method for you to, to move away from worry. Have you heard that uh, cheesy old saying, you know, you got to have an attitude of gratitude. An attitude of gratitude. It rhymes. It's cool. No. But really, thinking about that, why would you have to have an attitude that is grateful? What would happen if you start flooding your mind equally with the great things that are happening in your life versus the things that you can't control and the things that you worry about? You'd have almost a a, a playing field where things could collide, and it's like, well, this thing might happen, but God did take care of this. Oh, this thing might happen, but remember when God took care of this? So the opposite of worry is trust. And, and then the text here, it says, your heavenly father knows that you need them. He knows that you need food. He knows that you need clothes from Costco. No. No, he knows that you need. He knows what you need. Do you believe that he knows what you need? Do you agree with that you guys are on the same page of exactly what you guys think you need together? Of course, I need that bigger boat. Of course, it's a need, Lord. I'm going to take more of your people out on it. No, he knows what you need. So remember what God has been doing in your life. Celebrate that. 
do you celebrate around the table? When you get together, you're like, hey, I'm so glad we get to have another meal together. This meal is awesome. What, is God, what did God do this week here? What did you see him do? Or are we going to talk about the politician? We're going to talk about the economy. We're going to talk about gas prices. We're going to just drive this thing into the ground and leave more frustrated than when we sat down at the table in the first place. Or are we going to see the goodness of God? So write down, remember individually what God is doing in your life. And what are those blessings? Write them down. Write down your prayer requests and be able to go back and you can go back and see how much more confidence would you have if you went back 15 years in every prayer that you've, that you've ever asked God for and you went back and you saw all the prayers he answered. You're like, oh, I remember one of our guys I was working with, uh, they were a family of five and they were living in a, a single wide and it was tight quarters and one of the kids slept on the couch and all those things and he was like, man, I remember praying and we were praying, we were praying that God would just open the door for him and God opened the door and they have this amazing house. And their family grew up in this amazing house. And I go back, and I'm like, do you remember? And one of my other guys, this was in a small group, we were praying about job stuff, job stuff, job stuff. Yeah, that was 12 years ago. And he has a great job. And God's doing great things. And if I just could go through all of the things in your life that you prayed about, that God answered those prayers that was even more than you could think or ask, how, would that, how could you build up your trust instead of building up your worry? Jesus Christ, his kingdom will prevail. When we get worried, we get distracted, and we get unfocused off of the things that God would have us to be focused on. We can be concerned about something, hand it over to God, and then move to what he has us to do next. But to stay in that record loop, you need to change your focus, reprogramming your mind with the things of God. Do you have that community of people that you're talking about what God is doing. Is that happening in your life groups? You guys get together and ever talk about it in your life group? Hey, what cool things did you see God do this week? It takes some effort. It takes some intentionality. You know, we have studies for this. There's a study called the Genesis uh, process, which is a study, and it talks about what is the process like to change and how do you deal with double binds? And what is a double bind where you're like, well, I could do this, but then if I do this, and then if I do this, and you start moving through these things. But you can, like the tools are here. If you want to worry less in your life and be obedient to what God has for you, you can dive in. Like we, you can figure things out. You can figure out why you worry and why you worry about what you worry about and how to replace it. See, Jesus in uh, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, we're not there yet, but I wanted to steal this verse ahead, so sorry whoever's preaching on this one. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And that's what worry does, is it does make you weary, and it does burden you. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. See, worry doesn't allow rest for your souls. It doesn't allow rest for your mind. It keeps running around playing tricks and talking to you at night. And you need to put that to bed. It's taking up space in your brain that it didn't pay rent for. Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light. He is our hope, not our worry. Jesus is our hope, not our worry. Finally, I want to end with Philippians verse 4, 6 through 13. You've heard this. It's another great verse. Like, this is Paul talking to the church in Philippi. This is his final exhortation. This is the, what he wants to leave them with. And so here's what he says. He says, do not be anxious about anything. Just sit on that one. How many people have been anxious about something this week? A lot of you. A lot of you have been anxious, right? Okay, Paul, what's up with your anxiousness? Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, even mine, by prayer and petition, 
With thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You need to guard your heart and your minds from the devil's tricks and trying to have you worry all the time. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul is saying, reprogram your mind. Reprogram your mind. Start putting these things into your mind. What the, the mysteries of God, the amazing things that God d- does. Like look at, just open your eyes and go out and look and see his creation. Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of the peace will be with you. And he says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Like you, you cared. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. And I'm not saying this because I'm in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or living in want. I can do all things through Him who gives me strength. One of the, our elders who's in our sermon club had shared this with me. I thought it was interesting. We're talking about things that you worried about. And uh, he had said at this time, he's like, I used to worry about flying. And I'm like, well, how'd you get over that? What's the cure to worry? That's what we're trying to figure out. And he said that the Lord just shared with him, like, don't you think that I have something in store for you? Don't you think that I have something in store for you. When you worry, when something's coming, when a challenge is coming, are you thinking about the failure of that? Are you thinking about how God is going to show up? Are you thinking with the eyes that would look in the eyes of generosity? Or are you thinking with the stingy eyes that's worried about me and me and my? So keys in my mind to help you worry less. Stuff yourself with gratitude. Start thinking about all the things. Like, don't give, don't give worry space in your brain because you have a lot of things to be grateful for. And if you don't have a lot of things to be grateful for, get in a community and they'll help you understand some of the things that maybe you, can, you need to be grateful for. We need to be grateful individually when you wake up. Be grateful with your family. Be grateful in your small group. Be grateful in your church. Like, I would love to hear you guys talking about the cool things uh, that God is doing. When Peter joked about him staying here and us having to kick him out at the end of the service because his family hangs out here, they're talking about what like, God's doing in their lives. They love being around God's people because it encourages them, and they encourage others. So stuff yourself full of gratitude. That will help you to start reprogramming the record of worry that you put into your brains. And trust that God's got it. Think about what the opposite of worry is, is that he has got it. Do you trust him? He trusted us so much that he gave us his son. We're going to take this time to celebrate communion. If you did not get an element, um, raise your hand, and Ron or one of our guys will get this for you. He knew we were going to worry. And so Jesus encouraged us to not worry. He encouraged us to be people of faith, courage, and people of trust. He encouraged us to be different, to not be like some other people that are chasing after all of these other things. And he showed us a way. Do you know you don't have to worry about eternal death? 
If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've confessed with your mouth and you believe in your heart that he is Lord, you will be saved. Your life does not end when your last breath, last breath happens on this earth. Your life has barely begun no matter how old you are in here. Eternity awaits you with the Father in heaven. And this ensured this. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he uh, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, and this is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we remember you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, we proclaim your death. And we look forward, Father, to your return. Lord, I ask that through your word here and through this uh, time, Lord, that you would just guide people where you want them in regards to the worries that they have in their life. You would help them learn how to replace those things and replace them with uh, the thoughts of, of victory that you would have, Lord. That, yes, we can acknowledge things, we can be concerned about things, and we can acknowledge that in front of you, but we can move on and not be paralyzed in the arms of worry. That it doesn't get to take up this space. You get to take up this space. So, Father, move this church, move all of us towards trust, towards gratitude. Help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.